Are you worried about what miniatures you can and can't use in Horus Heresy? What's era appropriate? Which marks of armor do I use? Are you getting stressed about this stuff? Well, this is the video for you. We'll talk you through the very basic tenets of Horus Heresy modeling, how it differs from 40k, and introduce you to a few techniques you may not have heard of before. Hi, I'm Miles from the Legend Studio. For the past five-ish years or so, I've been a professional, well, I've been a bit professional miniature painter for longer, but I've run a Patreon for around five years, and it feels like every other week, I've produced a Horus Heresy tutorial. It's one of those things, uh, Horus Heresy, when I started commission painting, was the new hotness, and I gained a reputation for producing armies to a very high quality, for doing commu commission work, and it turned into that vicious circle, because I was known for Horus Heresy miniature painting, I get more commissions, and on the cycle goes and goes and goes. Um, and here I am, an authority of nothing, trying to convince you over the tenants or the things that I've picked up on the way uh, when it comes to Horus Heresy modelling. And more so than that, I've canvassed the community, social media feeds. Uh, what are the common concerns new people have when entering the heresy? Number one, what models can I use? Uh, yes, this is a really, really common fear. Um, what if I use the wrong armour plate? Did they have Mark VI at the outset of the heresy? Uh, am I using an area in the appropriate tank? Will my Primaris fit? In my marine force. Okay, so the heresy has an unfair stigma of being uh, full of rivet counters, uh, aggressively chasing people out of game shops because the knee pad is the wrong mark of armor. I, I, I've, I've never seen this in person. It feels like it's one of those internet isms that isn't true at all. Um, what I have seen from the horse heresy community is uh, <laughs> we're an exuberant lot, and it has its roots in historical wargaming. Uh, we've been nicknamed the World War II Dads of Warhammer. I'm not quite sure how to feel about that, whether that's sort of like a mark of honor or whether I should should feel old. Are we, am I old now? We're old now. We're all old. But cross-referencing black books, black library lore, little details and stories that you may have read in like your know, second edition uh, a box set, second edition lore, hell, even the Rogue Trader stuff has a lot of detail. Titanicus, the original, uh, is the first mention of any Horus Heresy whatsoever. I'm bringing these details to life. But please don't mistake that enthusiasm for gatekeeping. Heresy is full of exuberant people, it's full of passionate, passionate people, and this passion can overrun the dam slightly every now and again. But these people are only too happy to discuss their reasoning. On the whole, very reasonable people, very enthusiastic people about this hobby. And they just want to chat. They just want to help people realize the same vision that they have. Or maybe draw attention to certain details and aspects of the hobby that may have been overlooked by somebody who's completely new into this. But what is generally valid? So let's give a structure to this conversation. Armour marks. What armour marks are valid and which aren't? Well, marks 0 to 6. They are completely valid in Horus Heresy. Now, the mark 0 uh, is an imp it, it's the prototype. Um, it, wasn't go it didn't go into mass production. And it is the very first sculpted marine ever in the old RTB01 days, in the Rogue Trader days. Um, and this mark of armour is famously worn by a character, to, character named Litu. And if you're able to tell me what that name means or what the Easter egg is of that name, put in the comments below. I'll send you a virtual kiss. Okay, Mark 1 is Thunder Armour, used by the Legion Castagius. I, I feel sure I've pronounced that wrong. Castagius? I think it's Castagius. Or Thunder Warriors, much easier to pronounce. You don't see many Thunder Warriors wandering around in the battlefields of the 31st millennium. Very good reason. Won't spoil it here. But there's a wonderful book by Chris Wright called Valdo that explains why you maybe don't see too many Thunder Warriors or Mark I armor walking around. Mark II is the earliest crusade armor and is often used by Dark Angels 
and white scars, or more often seen in these collections. Why? The Dark Angels were the primogenitors of all styles of warfare espoused by the Legion. They are the architects of the Principia Bellicosa. This is the Space Marine art of war that was practiced by all Legions. So if you needed rapid assault, Dark Angels perfected those tactics. If you needed mass, uh, mass infantry assaults, they did it better than anyone else, or they'd like you to believe. White Scars, on the other hand, oh, sorry, so the Dark Angels would have earlier anachronistic marks of armor, weaponry, things that may be outlawed later on, but they kind of held on to anyway. You don't have to tell the Emperor everything, after all. White Scars for a wholly different reason. They range far and wide across the galaxy, and they more often than not went far beyond Imperial um, uh, lines of supply. So they would have older marks of armour purely because they couldn't get resupplied. So Mark II is seen there. Mark III is a heavier style of armour designed for void boarding actions and zone mortalis actions, up close dirty warfare. And you more often you more often see these marks of armour on breacher marines or iron warriors make extensive use of them because of their preferred style of warfare. Imperial fists because they like to copy the iron warriors. And indeed, any legion that would, or any collection, any uh, subset of a legion that would engage very heavily in zone mortalis actions. Mark IV, this is considered to be the pinnacle of space marine armour design. Ubiquitous, strong, long-lasting, durable. Um, it, th th this was, until this latest box set, the most popular armour of the lot. Um, and Mark Forrest is talked about extensively in the Black Books, especially in regards to the Lunar Worlds and the Sons of Horus, which do comprise some of the earlier novels. Um, yeah, up until this point, it is the most popular armour mark available. Mark V, my favourite heresy armour, and oh, I wish they produced these in, in uh, plastic first. But this stuff is dross. It's quickly, badly produced, mass manufactured armor just to clothe space marines. Uh, they they're full of like, uh, well, they are full of uh, bonding studs because the material used for the ceramite was so bad. It's made to deflect bullets and ammunition off the armor because it's not durable at all. It has wires on the outside, easily cut. It's a dreadful suit of armour. It's mass-produced just to give Legionnaires something to wear. And at this time, you have to consider that um, Legion strengths varied wildly. I think at this lowest point, a Legion would be like 120,000 Marines, whereas the larger Legions, like the Ultramarines, the Word Bearers, would have something like 250, 350 plus. And that's just the ones that were declared in the census. There could be... It's, I think it's in one of the black books. It's rumored that the word bearers could have half a million of marines at, what, at one point. So there are a lot of them. A Mark V armor. Uh, the reason why there are so many marines during the Age of uh, Darkness, even with the, all this phosphex and hellish warfare going on, is because of the mass implantation. The traitors especially f sped up the implantation process for space marines. And the loyalists did it too. They just needed... Babies to turn into hyper men killers. Uh, so they sped up the implantation process, and the Mark V, I guess, is sort of like a conjoined result of this basic need for soldiers in this arena. Mark VI will by far and away be the most popular Mark of Armour that we'll see in the future. Why? Because it's in the new box set. Um, this armour. Mark has a distinctive conical helm that contains additional sensors. Uh, that's why it's preferred by uh, Legion Seeker squads, Scout squads, and Legions like Alpha Legion and Raven Guard, because they operate in a lot of clandestine uh, operations. However, all Legions used all marks of armor extensively, two to six. There is no reason why you couldn't have your entire Iron Warrior warrior armor let me do that again there is no reason why you can't have your entire iron warrior army 
in Mark 6 because legions were huge and within them would contain subsections, subfactions that would espouse this style of military warfare. So you can use them. Two to six, you're on very good ground. And mixing armour. Now this is seen as a little bit of a faux pas in, in, in the Horus Heresy community. I personally do it. Because my Blood Angels are set to terror. They are a battered, wounded, drained force at this point. They are taking armour plates off traitor legionnaires they've just killed. To bolt onto them just to fight in the next battle. So mixing and matching armour, I don't personally have a problem with at all. Because it tells a story. Terminator armor. Yes. Uh, there are three kind. Well, there are more than that. Uh, Saturnine armor we'll come back to. But for our discussion, there are three types of Terminator armor. Cataphracti. Tartaros. And very limited quantities of Indomitus. Which is the 40k style of Terminator armor were used. However, the first two... The Tartaros and the Cataphracti have rules, and do have rules in the new edition, Indomitus doesn't. So if you were planning on uh, creating Haskals that are lore accurate from Praetorian of Dawn, I'd probably end up using Tartaros rules for them. So it'd have to be, uh, you'd have to sub them in there. But Tartaros and Cataphracti are currently the only two armour marks that we do for Terminator armour. Hopefully you'll be seeing Saturnine armor soon, which is like the big egg-shaped dudes. Fingers crossed for that. Tanks. Okay, Forge World itself grew out of a bunch of treadheads getting together and just wanted to make futuristic tanks based on World War II designs. So pretty much anything that you can still buy from the catalog will be valid for Horus Heresy. Granted, there isn't that much because they keep cycling out of production, but Legion Felglaives, things of that nature perfectly acceptable in fact i think th i can only really think of exceptions to the rule most tanks are valid within 30k the only ones that spring to mind that wouldn't be are the chimera the chimera sa chass chassis design was found after the horus heresy razorbacks similar reason and the black templar what's the name of their land raider crusader got it in one uh, because when they were on the, uh, one of the Crusades, they sort of ripped up a land raid and put bolters on the side of it. It's not a Mechanicum. Uh, it, it is not a Mechanicum approved design. So those are the only three tanks that really jump off uh, at the top of the head. Land raiders of any designs would be appropriate. Rhinos of any designs would be appropriate. Uh, with the rumours of the land raider Spartan being in the new box set and new rhinos. You're on pretty safe ground there. As long as you buy those things, you're on pretty good ground. Dreadnoughts. All Dreadnought patterns are valid. Unfortunately, the old box Dreadnought is going the way of the Dodo. We won't be seeing those in the new edition. But Contemptor Dreadnoughts, Deradios, Leviathans, all era appropriate, all designed by the Forge World Studio. Well, Jez Good, based off Jez Goodwin designs. But they're all there. You can use any of them. Go nuts. Do I need an airbrush to paint? No, you absolutely do not. Now, the Heresy is known for having a very specific style and painting process. It stems from military scale modeling where the use of weathering products uh, such as powders, uh, uh, chipping medium, and pin, washings, uh, pin washes are more prevalent, as well as airbrushes. They're a lot more prevalent, they're a lot more, I guess, accepted by military scale modelers than they could be within, say, like a 40k community, dare I say that, uh, where it's seen as a little bit of cheating. Ch -ch -ch. Uh, the use of this militaristic style of modeling is often known as the heresy aesthetic or the heresy style. Miniatures that aim to recreate a realistic image of the characters, and it's a style that I absolutely love using within the Horus Heresy. Would I use this style on a high elf force? No. It's, it's a different style. It's a different art style completely. But in Heresy, I want to feel like you're stepping into this ugly, grimy world. And you could take a picture of Horus. And that picture would be as accurate as you painting the miniature. I want you to feel like you're looking at a photorealistic image of that miniature. As closely as possible. Uh, 
most of my tutorials, most of my style, my ethos comes from this idea of representing things, of grounding even fantasy-esque elements in some manner of reality. However, this is one style, and this is just one dude on the internet telling you what to do. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. I'm very enthusiastic about what I do, but I don't want to stymie anybody. I, I, in fact, I think the Horus Heresy could do with more styles in it. I think it could do with a few heavier metal style painted armies. Why? Because diversity is never a bad thing. Introducing new people is never a bad, bad thing. Having more voices in this niche of a niche of a niche hobby is never a bad thing. So you absolutely do not need an airbrush. Um, the Heresy community is ferociously proud of its painting standards, I have to say. But again, please don't confuse enthusiasm for any kind of gatekeeping. There are multiple resources out there to help you paint your miniatures. From patrons, a you know, really good one, uh, to free painted videos on uh, YouTube. Again, yeah, really good for that. Uh, PDFs, and hell, just a whole community of people just willing to help. So engage with that community, engage with it meaningfully, because you'll get a lot out of it. You don't have to be a spectacular painter to enter any horse heresy events by any means you just have to paint your stuff that's what's more important and enjoy painting it as well that's rule number two heresy is just space marines versus space marines no i don't like space marines oh no 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 oh god no 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 <laughs> kind of yes uh there are a lot of marine armies hell this universe springs from Horus, the commander of the Adeptus. Oh, not Adeptus. Oh, I've made a slip there. The uh, the master of the Space Marine Legions turning on the Imperium. So, of course, it will be Space Marine-centric. Is based around that narrative frame. But there are other factions involved. If you do want to play Space Marines, you could play a different kind of Space Marines in Black Shields. No, you can play all sorts of different factions. Um, other fa factions include Mechanicum, Knights, Titan Legios. Yes, you can use Titans in this game and they are badass. Solar Ox, kind of elite humans. Cults of Militia. So what are each of these factions? Well, the Mechanicum. So what are each of these factions? The Mechanicum are the Red Rogue dudes from Mars and other Forge Worlds dotted around the universe. Uh, we're all pretty much familiar with what they are. Uh, knights, again, if you come from a 40k background, you'll understand what Knights are. Titans, you can include Reavers. Uh, there is a Lord of War allocation. You can either be used up by, well, anything with a Lord of War uh, designation to it. Thunderhawks, Stormbirds. Reaver Titans, full ass Reaver Titans, they're so fun to use in game. And Primarchs, of course. Uh, and then we have Solar Auxilia, which are the elite of the elite of human uh, forces at this time, who mainly engage in uh, void warfare. Very good at killing Space Marines, very good at killing Space Marines. Then we have Cults and Militia, which do stand in for the uh, Imperial Guard in this universe. Now, these factions more than likely will change in the future. Because we have a new edition on the horizon. And there's the always popular Adeptus... Ah, I did it again! The Custodian, the Custodian Guard. Uh, Popularised by Henry Cavill. That's some SOB. Within each of these factions are sub-factions... At every point in the Horus Heresy with list building or army creation, you're faced with choices. Do you base your army on the uh, Ad Secularis from Mechanicum, which are a lot, a lot of tech thralls and uh, cyber zombies? Or do you go for a more robotic version of them, uh, where you use things like Thanatars and, and like the, 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 the big robots that they have? The Space Marine list, do you go fast and salty or do you go attritional warfare? At every point, you pose a question. How do you theme your army? How do you create something that's unique to you? 
that's awesome. That's a challenge you should embrace or want to embrace anyway. Number four, how do I create an army? Now, things are changing because we have a new edition, but the Horus Heresy is deeply rooted within 7th edition mechanics. So, at its heart, you will need one character and two infantry. Now, the rules are changing where it favours infantry battles, especially infantry v infantry. Tanks are a little bit of death traps in the next edition. So, you really want big units of troops that will dominate areas of the battlefield. Uh, so, you can't go wrong at its base, one champion, anything with the um, Master of the Legion rule, so you can go with a Praetor, a Legion champion, things of that nature, just a dude with a sword and a gun will do you. And then two big units of tacticals, so it could either be tactical marines, assault marines, um, and in some lists you can rejig it, so terminators are troops. But ultimately, when theming an army, when creating an army, Pick the miniatures that you enjoy the most because the game designers have very much thought about this and the things that you will pick will not only be good, but you'll be able to use them in an army straight away. There'll be some mechanic, there'll be some way of using them directly in your army list. So buy without fear, buy the things you like, nine times out of ten, they'll work for you. So those are the common questions and concerns of new modelers. What I'd like to do is tell you three modeling techniques to get you started. Again, please disregard all of this. If you want an heavier metal style or if you have like a different style in mind, well, just skip this portion. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, hit that button, send me an email, send me physical money in an envelope to my house. That would be fantastic. Or if you want to learn different modeling techniques, sign up to the Patreon. That's also very good. $15. For a monthly subscription, you get absolutely everything we've done so far. It's 10% off an annual subscription. Anyway, see you later. No, but if you still want to hang around, I'll talk you through three very simple techniques that differentiate 40k modeling to 30k modeling. Okay, the first one, Zenthal highlighting. Now, granted, you do need an airbrush for this. Well, it makes it damn sight easier at the very least. But Zenthal highlighting is something that differentiates every metal style painting where everything is edge highlighted, all the details are brought to that bright polish, as opposed to heresy modeling where Zenithal highlight is created more often than not from a black background using white to up the value scale to help define armor marks, define the areas where light and shadow would naturally pool on a miniature. Miniature basically in black and white, you could add a color on top for ultramarines, blue, blood angels, red, etc, etc, etc. This is the basic building block to not only my technique, but a lot of people's techniques within the heresy. Instead of concentrating on edge highlighting, we instead concentrate on zenithal highlighting and volumetric highlighting, which gives a much more natural appearance to your miniatures. Number two, the pin wash. Now this is a favorite technique of mine because when you use the airbrush, it gives really nice soft transitions. Well, lacks is grit. You can't see the uh, definition of the model anymore. And pin washing is a technique where you gloss varnish the miniature. More often than not, you gloss varnish it because it makes the paint more predictable where it flows. And then you take a color. For Blood Angels, for example, you may want to take a dark violet color. Um, if you're using Games Workshop paints, great. Use uh, Drutchy Violet, add a little bit of gloss varnish into it, add a little bit of water, then you can feed it in between the gaps and recesses of the miniature and it creates a wonderful shadow. Very, very easy to achieve. I personally prefer using oils because it gives a greater sense of realism to the overall result and it gives me a much deeper, richer tone. But if you don't want the hassle, if you don't want the headache of learning oil paints, well, don't worry about it. You don't need them. Use a Games Workshop wash. Use an ink. Use a, a paint that you have already to feed into the gaps and recesses and that will give you much needed definition to your miniatures. And number three, weathering powders. Learning how to use weathering powders is one of those staples of Horus Heresy miniature modeling. Well, as it stands today, things are changing. You can get these from places like AK Interactive, uh, AK, uh, MIG Jimenez. Lots of places sell a whole variety of different um, uh, powders. On the whole, get sandy colors, get brown colors. And at the basis, at the start, just mix them up with a little bit of water, 
that's it. A little bit of water, thin them down, feed it in between the gaps and recesses. Less is very much more with this stuff because the amount of miniatures I've seen caked in this stuff from the like the knee downwards. It's deceptive in how it dries. When you apply it, it doesn't dry like that. So trial it on a piece of paper first or on a spare miniature, then hit your actual miniature with weathering powder and it will help tie it into the base, add greater realism to your miniature, and it just opens up a whole new avenue of miniature painting experience that was close to you before. So that was the video. That is the top tips that I would recommend, or the top, um, I guess, clarifications I would give to new people in entering the Horus Heresy and Horus Heresy modeling. Welcome, please be don't be intimidated. Join in the conversation, join in the communities, we're a, fer a, f a ferocious, voracious bunch, but we're very enthusiastic about the law, the history, and we just want the community to grow, and we, we dearly want you a part of it. If you did want to develop your own painting... Okay, this is where, this is where the, the uh, thing drops off. If you did want to learn how to paint miniatures to a higher degree standard, like myself, uh, please consider joining the Little Ledger Studio Patreon. We have hundreds of videos, all systematized all clarified on the little ledger studio website sign up for a month see if it's for you it's 15 dollars, and you get access to absolutely everything all previous pdfs all previous videos ranging from the art of compromise simple 20 minute videos to get your infantry just done and out to full-on primark master classes where we delve into the esoterica of miniature painting techniques color theory the lot. Thank you very much for watching the video. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, pop them below. Questions, especially on this video, please pop them below because I want to make a follow-up video to this based on the comments that you give me. So be ferocious, well, be ferocious and voracious yourself in the comments below and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers. Bye-bye.